All right, team, I think we're live streaming now. Yep, thanks, Tamika. Um, let's get going. Uh, just want to welcome everyone to the Strategy and Operations meeting for Thursday, the 18th of November. Um, just going to move to item number two, which is the Council Blessing, which I'm going to call on Councillor Pravanov to read out. Thank you, Mr Chair. As we deliber deliberate on the issues before us, we trust that we will reflect positively on the communities we serve. Let us all seek to be effective and just so that, with courage and vision and energy, we provide positive leadership and a spirit of harmony and compassion. Thank you, Jocelyn. And um, I haven't been... Oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, huh? <laughs> Yep, I will do apologies yeah. next. <laughs> um, just before I move on to apologies, I just want to remind everyone of the conduct expected of my meeting, just to be courteous and respectful to uh, your fellow colleagues, to staff and to other members. Um, we'll move now on to um, item number three, which is apologies. And Tanika, do we have any? I'm not aware of any. We don't have any apologies, although we do have um, Parapiti Muramati Community Board Member um, Guy Burns via Zoom. We have... Um, Councillor Rob McCann via Zoom, and we have um, uh, Councillor Bernie Randall via Zoom as well. So I'm um, just if, noting that they're all present, but just uh, virtually. Um, so no apologies. We move on to declarations of interest. None have been made aware to me. I'll just... Jocelyn, I'm assuming your light still oh, on a blessing. That's all good. All right. So we'll now move on to public speaking, which there is none, as far as I'm aware. Uh, members' business... Uh, there is no responses. Any leave of absence? No. Um, no matters of an urgent nature being brought to my attention. And so with that, we will move on to um, item number 7.1, which is the housing bill submission. I just want to check, I am moving the um, item... I am moving the Kotahi Tanga Board item number 8.3 forward and I just want to check with staff whether we want to do that now and then leave the house, how, I'm not too sure how long it will take us to get through the housing bill submission. So you don't envision that we're going to be here for 30 or 40 minutes on that? Safe assumption? Alright, so if you want to um, come forward, if um, Neil and... Um, the team don't mind, oh sorry, if you guys don't mind, just we'll go through the housing bill and then we'll come to you um, next, which should be in about, I'm, I'm hoping in about 10 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes. So um, team, welcome to come forward to the table or you're welcome to speak from there if you wish. Okay. Bring them forward. Okay, sorry. You're um, happy to wait, in other words, and go second? Yeah. yeah. Please use your mic when you're speaking because we've got three online. Uh, My mask interpretation was um, of, of that was not uh, obviously um, 100%, so thank you for the clarification. Um, uh, so we will now move to... Um, I'm just trying to think in terms of the... The six month update, item 8.3, found on page 29. So, for those that are on Zoom uh, or watching uh, online, we're now moving to item number 8.3, um, the update from the Kotahi Tanga Board. Um, and I invite you both forward. So, Neil, just um, welcome. And um, Scott, good to see you again. Thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come along and um, make yourself available along with, um, with Neil. And so I'm just going to... Um, I'm just trying to think in terms of just checking through the report. There's no intro from staff for this one. I just want to check if... No? He'd, we would, we'd he'd take it read in terms of the report. What's that, sorry? We would take the report take it as read. And... Thank you. All right, so Neil, I'm just going to hand it over to you and you can just walk us through and obviously tag team with Scott. Um, Scott, if you haven't used the mics before, the little, um, just watch um, Neil, the little red button, and then you guys walk through the report and then we'll open it up for questions from there. So over to you, Neil. Uh, 
Um, because because you two are external, we all have to wear our masks. Sorry. <laughs> so. That's okay. Well, thank thank you for the opportunity to to talk to um, my report. Um, and as, as you said, Scott is is my right hand man, and, and part through part way through this process, he will um, he will actually talk to a couple of items. So so um, and I'm just going to look at it's more of an executive summary um, r rather than go through the report itself. So. Um, Good progress has been made. Um, the ED team continues to um, perform, you know, at a very high standard, and and are now well resourced. So, um, so that part is going well. The board is now up to full strength again as well, um, with Harani's um, arrival to the board table. Well, not quite. Her first uh, board meeting is next week. Um, so, so, so we were, where are we? We've secured funding. We've secured funding for an education and training hub feasibility study, so that, that's important. The food, we've secured um, funding for food and beverage and, and cluster strategy. And, and for um, parts of the implementation of the um, destination management plan. So that includes uh, business models for, for visitor experience opportunities, uh, training programs and projects. And then we secured money to secure some money, so obviously for bids, <laughs> for bids for funding. So for the um, Centre of Excellence for plant-based food, um, we've we've got the team in place to to, to develop those bids. Um, that's for the capex for the centre, uh, and and that's with Kanoa, and the regenerative horticulture project with MPI. So we've we've secured, as I say, the ability to be able to go in that, into those funding rounds. That that of course requires resources. That's that's um, quite specialised, and and um, they, those. Those teams have been picked and, and, and they're about to do their task now. It's likely to take three or four months. So we're talking most of the, those, those funds and most of those activities will, will be spent and, and we will have product, if you like, for want of a better word, out of the, at uh, around about March to April. So <clears throat> the next thing that we've done is complete the destination management plan and that it's a good plan. And like we've talked about previously, it's, not just the plan, it's the implementation of it, and, and so we, we've got together um, a, uh, an advisory board, to a, so, so it's a tourism advisory board, which is tourism business, it's tourism specialists and operators that, it will, be, be, that uh, will be responsible for um, supporting us in the implementation of, of that plan. And Scott is, is, is a member of that, of that team. We've substantially completed a workforce plan, um, that's that's still with um, with stakeholders to, to fine tune, and, and that'll be available um, around about February 22, 2022. Uh, so our minds now are turning to to what that implementation considerations are in and around that. Uh, we're scoping an intergenerational sector strategy for the active plus 65s, uh, focusing on economic and and market aspects. And that's complementing the ageing strategy, which has been developed by council. But but with with a with a, it's a sliver really. It's looking at you know um, how they can contribute to um, to to our economy, how they can contribute to their own growth and and development. And and um, and there's plenty of interesting information offshore, but we need to really um, get that brief together, and um, and and focus and, and get that piece of work up and running. Scott is going to talk about some new projects that we've introduced. One is the Health Tech Hub, uh, and, and the other really is more of an organic process around just an IT strategic conversations, just, just to see where that might lead to. What, what, we've got such a talent pool um, in, this, in this district, and, and, and they, need, they need to be sort of involved, and, and they want to be involved, and it's, it's just giving them not a script, but the opportunity to really just to... to to freeform some some ideas and to look to see whether that will you know find itself into um, you know into into, into a business activities or or the, or the or the start of that. We've strengthened key relationships with uh, Kanoa, which is a regional ED and investment unit of, of MB. Um, the documents is, is now sort of uh, been sent to um, to um, the uh, the uh, sorry to to Kanoa from us, which highlights our. Um, sector priorities 
and that then goes to the RED ministers, the regional economic development ministers, and that goes to them on the 8th of December. So what we do with them with Kanoa, and this is how we work with Kanoa, is that um, we'll work through projects together, and, and when it goes to the RED, RED ministers, um, it, they have a context of what our priorities are so they can see how the projects fit into, into that framework. Wellington, New Zealand, we've um, got to a stage where they have uh, committed to, to funds and a lot of those funds will go to, um, to those areas I've, ident I've, I've identified already. Um, w it's like with any um, organisation, there's still some outstanding negotiation that we'd still like to collect a little bit more money and, and, and it's been a very convivial, it's been it's very um, professional um, interaction and you know John Allen is is is, um, is going out to find and turn over some stones to get some more funds that we need for the destination management plan um, we've also been involved with a you know communica community communication with Kida and in the chamber listening and sharing what their ideas are what what um, what our ideas are and that's that's a healthy relationship and and it's one that we want to to grow and develop further on the business models, we're looking at either an unincorporated joint venture or a charitable trust to be the contracting partner uh, party for the MPI project. Um, that is race. Basically, we have to look for a, for a vehicle, a business vehicle, because the Kotahi Tanga Board is not an entity and it, and it cannot directly contract contact contract with organisations. So the more transactions we, the board generates, um, it probably may mean um, an, an increasing number of special purpose vehicles that uh, need to be developed. So we need to keep our eye on that and, and, and in doing so, recognising that um, initially um, the current board was, was always seen, I think, as transitionary in, its, in, in the way it's, it's, it's been structured. Uh, so the board will review the merits of, of other models um, that, that um, would provide greater flexibility to partner and leverage opportunities um, for delivering major projects and in business, and we'll make a recommendation to council, you know, in the first quarter of next year. So where the board's up to, um, it's time for us to take stock. And in January, we're going to um, have a planning session that looks at those business models, but also looks beyond, so beyond the feasibility studies and beyond the bids to see what structures and what pathways we need to develop. Um, ahead of time so that we're prepared and can get can continuity, if you like, and, and momentum from from the initial um, uh, pieces of work that have been, been done in that regard. We're also going to, um, with a strategy review, look at it and look at the priorities again and and titillate it in a way that, that, that we think is, is, is going to be the most productive way of going forward. So that's what's ahead of us, um, that's what's behind us. Uh, Scott is going to just update you then on the Health Tech Hub and, and on the IT strategic conversations. Thanks, Neil. Kia ora, everybody. Oh, great. What a technology. Love it. <laughs> um, kia ora, everybody. Um, I, I don't know if you know, but I'm also on the board of Electra, the Lions company. Uh, one of those subsidiaries is a company called ESL, and uh, we are... Uh, partnering with uh, Tawara uh, to, um, to launch a research project in early next year uh, to predict falls in the aged population. It's using technology uh, from overseas, uh, very advanced technology, so uh, this is a pilot uh, that will hopefully lead to, um, uh, to, to other projects. It's, it's really advanced R&D, so it's using artificial intelligence and sensors around the home to monitor the gait of people and, um, and predict the likelihood of a fall. Um, and and if, if an aged person falls, it's estimated to cost the government around $80,000 per annum for recovery. So we think it's really advanced R&D. Um, the cornerstone of that will be based with uh, Tawara. Uh, we think that this could lead to the cornerstone of a health tech hub not necessarily focused on the age community, but really using advanced technology like AI and remote sensors um, to detect things like falls um, uh, and other, you know, other other potential conditions. Uh, rather than um, rather than kind of base it specifically at Tawara, uh, our strategy is to create a sort of centre of gravity. So we've 
I've had some early discussions with the Ministry of Health. They're actually, they really like the idea of regional technical hubs. Um, we've done some research. There are around 600 people that work for Capital Coast Health and the Ministry of Health that are up in the region, so there's a, a real desire for some of those folks not to commute. And there are some other initiatives um, that, that we think could be the cornerstone of this. So it's early days yet, but I'd, I'd like to think that we'll... Um, We'll kick off this project early next year. It will be a, also a demonstration type facility, and and that would lead to uh, to to uh, the growth of a health tech hub. And we'd hope that they would attract some other startups, um, some potential investors. So no location yet determined, but we're trying to you know uh, you know generate some interest from other organisations. I'm also uh, getting together a group of uh, technical people. As Neil said, that there's a lot of IT people. Many of them that, that are retired. Uh, and, uh, but have a great deal of experience and, and networks. I'm unconvinced of a, a general IT tech hub. They don't seem to work. Uh, and it's, my, my feeling is uh, that there's already conversations around an avionics hub, but, but more specific around some key areas. And one of the areas that we've identified, and certainly that um, Electra are very keen on, is energy tech. Uh, so. Um, one of the challenges that, that we, we think about all the time at, at uh, Electra is the growth of you know, distributed energy. And so, um, and so understanding the impact of solar panels, electric vehicles, heat pumps, and the growing choice of consumers that will want a sort of uh, arbitrage between uh, generating power and selling that to, to the regional community and then, um, and then buying it at, at peak times is something that, that we're really interested in from a lecture point of view. Concerned about that if everyone buys uh, you know, electronic vehicles and plugs them in at the same time, the impact on our network. But also, importantly, in line with that is um, uh, the Electricity Amendment Bill, which, which, uh, which is in its first reading, which may change the entire fabric of, of how people consume and sell power on electric networks. So we think the timing is right. There's a, a number of in initiatives with ECA. So it's early days, but I think that, that, that this region and, and certainly the work that Electra is doing could lead to more research specifically in technology, AI, and um, electrical management in terms of power grids and managing and optimizing power grids. So, um, uh, so I think from a technical point of view, uh, the first challenge is, re is really to take stock of, of who we have within the community, bring some ideas, and then kind of bring some horsepower focused on specific technical challenges. And, and that, that might be uh, te tech hubs like the Health Tech Hub and potentially an energy tech hub. That's it from me. Excellent. So I'm just going to go to um, Councillor Buswell first, actually, to see whether she's anything as a, a member that she wants to add in terms of the work that you're doing, and then I'll open it up for questions. Thanks, um, Mr Chair. Um, I would just like to thank the Kutai Tanga Board for the energy that they have put into it, uh, pardon the pun, but um, <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Scott, for coming along today and just running through some of the key projects that you're really involved in. And, and again, I'd also like to thank you for bringing these initiatives to Kapiti. They could have gone to the Horafanua <laughs> through Electra. So um, really excited to have you on board and your, um, and your passion for, for the Kapiti Coast and, and bringing that to us. Also, um, thank you, Neil, for your commitment to um, the Kote Tanga Board. And just um, in reflection, last week we had a... Um, um, an evening with uh, the Chamber of Commerce where all of the ED staff were present, which was really fantastic for the Chamber um, community to be able to openly and frankly have a chat about life in business in Kapiti. So that was really fruitful and, um, and I, I know that the Chamber membership certainly got a lot out of it. So thank you to the team for, um, yeah, for the ongoing work. Thanks, Ange. Um, so we've got Darren Grant here, we've got Mark Ward, both from Council, and we've got Neil and Scott. I'm going to open it up for questions now, and um, and the team will just decide who's more appropriate. It may be, I mean, one of the questions here I think are probably more for staff there to answer. So, Your Worship, over to you, and then we'll move around the table. Um, the Chairman, I just need to remove my mask, otherwise my Indian accent in the mask will give you double Dutch. <laughs> um, I've got two questions. 
First is the how the Kotai Tanga board is working with the parallel universe, which is the Maori Economic Development Strategy. I know that some of the work that you're already doing is starting to interface in that area. Uh, do we have a clear pathway in terms of um, how the economic development strategy on the Maori side is heading? And also how their views can influence mainstream economic development philosophy that underpins some of the stuff that we do or the direction we want to take given uh, sustainability, climate change issues, and the whole collapse of the neoliberal bullshit on consumerism. That's my first question. Okay, should we deal with that first? Uh, Darren, could you just deal with where, the, where the Maori economic development's at and then, then I can sort of add we, how that we can inter interact with that? So we're just working through the process in terms of uh, a refresh of the, the current Maori economic development and wellbeing strategy at the moment. And we look at that as being a key piece of work for us in the 22-23 um, financial year. Um, that would be in, done in conjunction with the board and the EV representation on the board and making sure that that's a joined up process with EV partnership team and other parts of council as well. And what I'd like to, to say to that really is that, that um, our conversations around the board table are, are very much um, in, in balance with 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 um, with what um, iwi and and others are, are, are looking for we find that that Russell when we're looking at projects Russell will, will give an overlay in terms of um, an iwi perspective and we and it's just integrated into our sort of decision making um, process so um, as it relates to the the, the the need for a refresh around the um, economic the Maori economic um, development plan it's 2007 wasn't it I think um, so it's, it's 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 it needs a refresh, and and we need we then need to get around that and look to see how can we, how can we then, you know, look to see what is required and and what it is that we can do to to advance it. If, if I could just add to that too. Oh, sorry, Scott, have you got something you want to add there? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think a good example of that is the um, sustainable uh, food project. Yes. So this is the food tech hub. So not only you know are we actively supporting that, and there's a you know an opening happening soon um, but we're also looking at the supply chain for that and yep. so um, so uh, Kim and, and the rest of the board are talking about what that supply chain for the sustainable foods might look like with the local iwi on the Kapiti coast so we're seeing a, a way more holistic approach that, that incorporates uh, not just the business ventures but, but also the local iwi as suppliers and part of that supply chain. And just to add to that, that, that was certainly something when sustainable foods came into the, initially came into the mix and we made them aware of the, the fact that we were looking at regenerative um, horticulture. Um, immediately they, they were, they're looking to try and ensure that their supply lines are coming from within, within the district as much as they can. They're still, still sourcing from overseas, but, but, um, but, but certainly... Um, yeah, the, the connections has been made, and that's been because we're looking at, as you say, more more holistically. Thank the, you. And 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 what's happening also, we're finding that Kim is then going out into the area and working with trusts to ensure that the connections are, are, are all made clear and and effective. And and that's why we've got a good we've got good feedback in terms of you know where this this major project um, with MPI will go. It's it's a it's a major project. It's um. It's something like 1, 1 to 1.4 uh, million a year over seven years. So it's, it's major, and, and it's going to make a difference. And it's going to have a big impact on, on Maori. Thanks, Sam. If I could just add, Your Worship, um, having not been involved with the Kotahitanga Board, but had Kotahitanga Board members involved with the Māori Economic Development Panel, um, I've certainly seen exactly what you've talked about. I think, Neil, you said... Um, interconnected or something, Scott said holistic, uh, I saw it as a very much a blended approach yep. um, and so we saw the um, the expertise and the experience coming through from the Kotahitanga members into the Māori ED panel and, and I imagine vice versa in the Kotahitanga board and, and we're hearing that today. Um, just as a, a slight um, side topic to that, um, having just been approached by the iwi team to sit on the panel for the Māori ED grants, you will see another tranche of those run out this year but it is simply for the, I imagine for the reason that Darren has said that the review is underway and so they're going to run them for another year so just in case you get a little bit confused seeing that going out there back to you Your Worship um, My second question is a good, this is a good segue into my second question 
for almost two decades now, the economic development strategy of this district has been shaped by urban businesses. Um, the issue of rural, the rural economy, which we do have one, hasn't surfaced as much, apart from some years ago, 2011, 2012, when Gail Ferguson was around, she did some work around the greater Otaki agriculture potential. It's good to see that finally you're starting to land something, but it's project-based. The horticulture re regenerative, um, regenerative horticulture is project-based. Do we th do you think that we need a much wider encompassing encompassing view of the rural economy as such? Because we are at a stage now where there will be tensions between uh, the use of productive soils for agriculture and the alienation of that to housing. So unless the underpinning for the rural economy is measured out in economic terms, in, in terms of projected potential, um, the the offset of that is how people can make quick money out of just turning that into housing. The pressure will come, market forces will come. So how are you looking at that in terms of balancing out the need for this? Having said that, EV particularly are concerned about food sovereignty. While mainstream talks about food security, they talk in terms of food sovereignty. So there is a, a pot potential link down there in terms of the preserving the agricultural uh, rural rural economy uh, with the uh, Maori perspective. I just want to know what you are thinking in this area. Look, it's fair to say around our table we've got a very active um, person in uh, Chris Claridge who who is who is making sure that it's front and centre and in and around us. Um, the purpose of the purpose of our get together in January. Is, is literally to, to, to look at what we've learned in the last um, 12 months, what we've seen in and around us and, and what we should factor in. So, so we still to have that conversation, but that conversation is planned for January. Over to Mark, I think. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, to Mayor Guru's key point about the difference in culture of Māori business versus Pākehā business. Um, the Māori business purpose includes very much an intergenerational approach where they employ uh, whānau, uh, find, create jobs for whānau, but also the kaitiakitanga is really, really important. And so with the interaction that we're making at, at the base level as well, so working with the Māori business network, which extends from Foxton to Paikakariki, so working with them on the workforce plan in particular has brought to light the very cultural aspects that Mayor Guru is, is mentioning. And whether urban or whether rural, um, the values of uh, kaitiakitanga are coming through loud and strong. So with urban businesses, it, it is around you know carbon zero and minimising waste. With the rural sector, it's around sustainability. In fact, regenerative means to improve the environment through your activities. So there, there's a, a, a growing well of, uh, of uh, participation and thinking and the sustainability business network has also been involved in our district as well to help us understand where both rural and um, urban businesses can improve the track record and take a te ao Māori uh, approach which is very much around um, kaitiakitanga. Thanks, Mark. That's helpful. Um, I'm going to move to the next um, councillor, but for those that are on Zoom, I will come to you <coughs> at the end of questions. I haven't forgotten about you. Councillor Elliott. Hi, thank you very much. Um, it's always very inspiring when you come in, and it's great to see the Kojitanga board um, really, really uh, developing legs and, and gathering speed. It's fantastic. My question is, I was wondering if your board are going to or have submitted to the district growth strategy because I'd be very, very keen and looking forward to your submission, if you are. Yes, we are, and I think it's due the 19th, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> so the short answer is yes, we are. Mm. OK. Councillor or Deputy Mayor Janet Holborough. Kia ora. Thank you very much for your presentation today. And I was also at the... Um, event the other night with the Chamber of Commerce and that was a very productive session and there was a request to have more of those. So I look forward to attending some more of those sessions. At that, um, 
at that session, I asked about the as a cultural well-being portfolio holder, the, the role of arts and heritage in economic development, and um, there was quite a bit of detail that was supplied by uh, Mr. Ward at that evening. So I'm wondering if we could, if I could ask that same question: What are we doing in terms of arts and creativity? I noticed that in the implementation plan on page 43 of the agenda, or is it 42, 43, there is one piece of work, and that's the only one I could find around crea the creative sector, and that's led by the uh, Kapiti Creative Industries, um, or the, the Kapiti Creative Industries Cluster Group. Um, but I'm aware that there's quite a lot more that's going on that's not reflected in the paper, so I was wondering if I could have a bit more information. I thought the answer that was given from Mark was excellent, and I think that the, the council should should hear that. Um, but what what the board is 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 really in that particular role is a support player. So there is a leader, and and that is as you say the creative. Um, it so happens that next week I'm I'm meeting with um, with uh, Jenna, Jenna, Jenna Lee, and, and we're going to go about identifying what, what the industry plan looks like and what the industry actions are, are going to be. So we're still to get into that conversation as, as, a, as a board, but, but Mark, um, with his other experience and, and his, his response, I thought, think should be heard from by the council. Thanks. Through you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, Deputy Mayor Holborough. So I referenced what Whanganui District has done with their creative sector and they had a real strength because of the, the art school that was based in Whanganui that was second to none and then became part of UCOL and then got closed. Um, so basically, um, the, the process that we will go through with um, Creative Kapiti as it's been renamed, uh, that Jenna Lee Philpot heads up, the process we're going through, and it starts on Monday in fact, is to um, co-design with her that key component of the plan based on the process, I guess, that I had fortune to be part of in Whanganui to rejuvenate the creative sector around the arts community. One of the hardest things for artists to do is be both business people and artists. So that's very well recognised. And yes, Creative New Zealand has a lot of funding to help artists, but actually it's the people on the ground that wrap around artists. And so there's a role for KEDA in, in terms of business mentoring. Artists don't get out of bed in the morning to go straight to zero and do their accounts. They actually want to. So the, the idea to, is to work with Jenna Lee to make this a reality. What, what has tended to happen in Whanganui and even here is that artists are very much individualistic. So we need to get them together as a, a, a bit of a forum. We need to agree their priorities get them to say, these are the gaps we have, how do we address these in monetizing or commercializing and actually promoting um, our, our businesses. And it goes beyond events, it goes beyond uh, tourism type activity. It actually speaks to the nub of what an artist does really well and what they don't do really well and how the network can support them and also council and in Whanganui there is a large public arts fund and there is a considerable amount of budget put into uh, a strategic lead in the creative industries which sits under economic development in Whanganui. So Whanganui recognises that the arts uh, is a GDP generator, it's a tourism generator, but it's also well-being for the community through the pursuits that the artists go through. So it really ticks in almost every box including the commercial box, but it's the commercial box that it's the hardest to realise. And, and uh, I think Jenna's a fantastic voice and a fantastic thinker. What she needs is some wraparound um, through what is identified in the Economic Development Implementation Plan, and, and that is a process that I hope we can go through with her as a collab. Can I have a follow-up question? Yeah, we really, really welcome your experience in that area in terms of in terms of that work because I think that's really crucial. We've got such a strong sector there. There's another side to kind of cultural well-being, and that's our kind of infrastructure that we deliver to support 
economic development through culture and heritage. And I'm thinking of the uh, Mahara Gallery redevelopment that's happening at the moment to Uruhi, which will be crucial in terms of delivering that as well. And then there's also the Waikanae Library, which is listed on page 42, and it's priority two. I'm just wondering, because it's so crucial to the economic well-being of that local area, why it's priority two and not a priority one for this group. Do you want like, I have a first go at those in terms of what, what do you want to do? Do you do Speak through this. As I've said, um, we, the board is reviewing this now. So, so we, we've we've taken our first run. We've we've identified what we believe is important and how it can build an infrastructure that we need and what we can build from. And and our next cut now has to be looking at each of those line items and understanding what it is that should be prioritised. And so we we, we we will have that discussion and and have have a, an answer for you um, going forward. What what we're going to be doing in this following year. That's fantastic. I mean, can't do everything at once, and no. so much has happened already, and I really appreciate that, and the board certainly hit the ground running, so thank you okay. for all the work that you do. I suppose, through the Chair, I suppose I'd just add to that, in terms of when this was set, this was set last year, that project was still in the formation stages of it, um, in terms of working with the PMO, so the ED sits on the board of the PMO team to make sure there is a joined up approach and you know basically part of the scoping for that project and so that's working really well and I think you know in terms of where it's going to it's an opportunity as to discuss that further with the board it's the same with Te Uruhi and the gallery mm -hmm. you know the, the board you know the ED team is actively working with the PMO office mm -hmm. to make sure that those perspectives are thought about at an early, at an early stage and through the project. Yep. Thank you. We've been going for a wee while, team, but um, given that the Kotahitanga board only comes to us every six months, I think it's good to have the discussion. So we'll just keep going. Um, I've got Councillor Hanford and then a couple of other councillors, and we'll look to see who's on Zoom. Councillor Hanford. Cool. Kia ora. Kia ora, Neil. Kia ora, Scott. A couple of questions. The first one, um, kind of around the network type of approach that you've mentioned in terms of the um, you know, various food and beverage, um, different different kind of sectors, but also the creative sector and wondering what kind of role a network kind of centred around climate action has. So for example, the businesses for climate action stuff, you're probably aware that there's a workshop um, that KCDC is co-hosting alongside the Sustainable Business Network happening next week. So I'm really keen to understand what could, what's the potential for, for something to kind of, I guess, fall out of or be created out of that. And then what you see the role of the board being in helping to facilitate something along that line. Um, and also what the role of the council ED team is, where by which it's kind of a learning experience for people as to how they can, for businesses to, as to how they can reduce their emissions and sharing kind of experience and, and kind of creating a bit of a forum um, for that to happen. So just, yeah, I would love a response to that, please. And I've got one more question. <laughs> bit of a, yeah, bit of a big one. It hasn't really come up in our society. It hasn't really come up in our, in our board meetings, but, but there's certainly an opportunity. One of the areas that I've been exploring is the Edmund Hillary Foundation. And so that's a network of about 600 uh, foreign, foreign people from around the world that want to come and live in New Zealand. And I've actually looked through the list because here's an opportunity for people that uh, actually want to eventually end up here, but willing to contribute either financially or in intellectually uh, to support initiatives. And if you look at that list, about 20 to 30 per cent of those are really focused on, on the environment, sustainability, climate action. And, and they often bring uh, you know, not only uh, overseas perspectives, but a lot of experience in that area. And so I, I think using that network approach, but uh, you know, w what would it centre on? Is it, is it more of an information centre or, or is it a, a lighthouse project? I don't know, but I, I think the networks that we're planning, putting together would support that. And we should, we should look at our more external networks like 
for example, MB, which has a uh, overseas R and D attraction program. Uh, networks like the Edmund Hillary Foundation, and uh, and I see that as part of the role that the Kotangata Board can do is to kind of expand out into those networks, um, and then and then either bring them together. In my experience, typically around a kind of a lighthouse project. And initially, we we did we and have identified and and still have one on on, on our books of 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 those projects that um. That, that could align to what you've just talked about. Well, one was the um, Sparagopsis, <laughs> which which was the um, which is still not off the books. But no. fun, fundamentally, that that's um, it's the seaweed that's been trialled for for cows to to suppress flatulence. Um, they're they're um, they're trialling that in, in in Australia at the moment, but 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 we still you know um, have an interest and 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 want to pursue that. One of the um, the projects that's been uh, is is a, a company that's coming or looking to come to New Zealand, um, and is currently there's a due diligence being done um, from NZTE is 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 in the clean energy sector as well. So so it's 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 been there. W when we had Rawiri around the table, um, that, he he brought that lens you know into most of our discussion. Um, we've now changed over. Um, Nadi uh, he, he was he was sought after for for other things. Um, so he did bring that lens around the table and. And it is something that we have to remind ourselves to do, and 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 um, and have got out of the habit of it since Rawiri has left. But um, but certainly the, the networking approach is, is is the approach to go. Just got a comment from uh, Mark. Conscious of time, Mr. Chair, through you. Just just to say that we continue as an ED team. So to your point about what is council's role is to really facilitate these business networks and support them. They often find it very hard to exist on their own because they're all volunteers, very busy business people. So we make sure we get alongside them and facilitate, um, intervene with uh, you know useful interventions. So you will see a rise of these networks that are hopefully going to feel a lot more supported um, over the next year or, or so, and, and that will then lend, lend to collective effort. Oh, cool. Go. There we go. Yeah, that's that's great. Thanks for those answers. And I've also linked up, is it Eva from the Economic Development Team with the Chia Sisters who founded Businesses for Climate Action in the Top of the South. And their aim is to have a thousand businesses from the Top of the South Island signed up measuring their emissions and reducing them by the end of this year. So they're doing some incredible mahi and they're really happy to help implement something similar here um, by supporting kind of what that might look like and, and figuring that out alongside the team. So really happy to continue to um, support with making those connections if that's helpful for the team because I'd love to see that as being part of that networked uh, approach. My second question is around the kind of intergenerational nature that you spoke of, Neil, and just wondering how how the board plans to continue or, or to begin those kind of conversations. I know you and I have had a brief call it all, but I'd love if the rest of the table could. Yeah, look, and, and, and I talked about what we need to do in January. I know it's, I seem to be kicking for, for January, but, but that's a time when we do need to reflect and, and need to to look at what we've learned and, and, and to build in you know, what we need to. And intergenerational representation in and around implementation is critical. You can't just have one lens, you have to have many lens. And, and the workforce plan itself, you know, in, in the implementation of that, is, is an opportunity, I think, to, to look at um, just getting a broad range of intergenerational um, uh, lens and, and contribution to, to make sure that we have good, rounded you know, um, decision making on the other side of that. Cool. So, so it's only just starting, um, yeah. but but it's certainly it's in our it's in our sights. It's all good to hear. There's a commitment okay. to it, though. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Councillor Pravanov. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just picking up on a comment that um, our mayor made in relation to um, I suppose the the um, the tension between um, high quality horticultural land and potential housing, and I know the question was asked to you about what. Um, what you guys were doing, but I suppose my question is, uh, what could council be doing in that space as well? well yeah. So, so, so in terms of, uh, I'm just following up on the question that the mayor asked in relation to um, the tension between um, losing good quality horticultural yeah, land yeah. for for urban um, for housing, and the, I suppose the question to you was, 
how um, the ED team could actually help in that area, but I'm, I, my, I'm turning it around the other way and asking yeah. what, as, as a council, what what this council could do to um, to manage or yeah. work in that area. I, I'd like to understand how the council is approaching that and, and what criteria they're using to, to, to determine um, what that balance should be. Um, we are we are working just in a slither of that, and we're, and we're looking and 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 trying to to get projects going where it is looking at product, productive sort of um, outcomes in the horticulture area. But but you you've got the you've got the you're the policy holder. You're the one setting the rules, and it's just a would be good to get an understanding of of, of how you propose to balance that. Neil, if we could just hold that question there, Jocelyn, and maybe we'll bring that question back in when Jason comes to the table on the other piece within the agenda, because I think it, I understand you know, the point, um, that's why it's being raised, mm. and it, it's possibly outside of the scope of a little bit of Neil and his it's team, and we'll bring it in with Jason when he comes through. So have you got another follow-up question? No, that's fine, thank you. Thank you. We'll remember to bring that back later. Um, Councillor Halliday. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have four questions, but um, look, first I just want to say thank you very much to the board. You know, uh, myself, I know Angela, Bos uh, Councillor Buswell, and others have been involved in a very long process to get this group to the table, and it's um, reassuring and um, also um, yeah, really refreshing to see um, you guys in action. Uh, and it's by far exceeding my expectations so far. So thank you very much. Uh, first thing I wanted to have a quick touch on was the a um, little bit about the uh, health tech network, but I, I just wanted to see whether you were aware of the Kapiti Community Health Network. Uh, this is a pilot program um, that's uh, tied in with the CCDHB, um, Atiawaki Fakarongatai, and Tioro Compass Health. Um, it's initially a uh, pilot program um, with regards to the area. Have you had any contact or aware of anything that could fit into that with regards to the health things you're talking about at all? So we, no, we haven't. No, we, we discussed it the other day. <coughs> yeah, so yeah. No, I, th I think that's, that's the next step is to engage with them. Sure, that's great. Um, yeah. And yeah, to see what leads us, really. Okay. I think, you know, bringing all those people to the table in terms of what could what could happen uh, is really part, it would be very powerful. So, mm. yeah, I'd like to follow up on that. Well, now that's going through a bit of a reimagining at the pros at the moment, but uh, that is involved in the um, development of the governance group around that as well. So okay. that could be a link into that. Um, the second thing um, is around the develop well, the uh, proposed development of the Faramaku Park concept. Um, the government precinct uh, that Sheffield Development's looking to develop, the Faranui Fern House that Puki Tapu Hapu and Nahina Trust are interested in, as well as the development of the <coughs> Faramaku Stream in Walsong. Um, now this has full support around the council table, um, and is potentially well, it's got the potential to be a significant development in the CBD. Are you guys developing a relationship with this group at all? Yeah, look, we, we had um, we had Marco. Uh, he presented to the last board meeting, and and that was favourably received around the table. I think that um, that and and he's he's since come back and and identified this himself that it needs to be underpinned, you know, by a business a business case. The, 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 it's very aspirational. It's 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 um, it's something that sits sits pretty well, but but it needs to be knitted together with with a business case that 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 um, would enable them, I think, to, to, to make you know a further further progress with with um, more discerning stakeholders. Neil, if I can just cut in there too, because I, I think it's come up on some other different topics. It's important for elected members to note that the board is working towards the priorities within the schedule that's yes, attached, and so some of these might be great ideas, but they just don't. I'm not saying that one doesn't. Obviously, you've had a meeting with them, but I imagine the board's first thing when they look um, at the stuff is where does it fit in terms of year one and year two, and that's and the that, that, that's, that's correct. Yeah, Fair and enough. and but 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 also we should be open, you know, um, to 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 what else is happening in the community. Totally. And and. Um, and not put a lot of time and effort into it, but 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 give some steers and and some advice. Excellent. The third thing I just wanted to plant a seed. Actually, um, six month reports are great, but um, I'd actually be quite interested in uh, potentially having maybe a briefing uh, in between. That's maybe a little bit less formal uh, between governance and yourselves. Um, uh, that's just planting a seed at the moment. I appreciate it. We'll have to go through a process uh, yeah. as such, maybe, but um, just to build the relationship, but also just to um, you know keep a handle on what you guys are doing because it yeah. sounds like there's quite a lot of stuff there that's going to be developing quite quickly. Yeah, yeah I, I get that, and and um, and we we've got um, precious time really. There's, there's two hours, you know, with with the board each month, and they then go out and and, and, and work around it. But um, but we've got to try and manage, I guess, you know, how, how to be productive as well. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I think the other thing to note there too, Martin, is that that expectation is set by 
Council as part of the, just remind me, Mr Chief Executive, in terms of their reporting back, yep. is our expectation as part of that performance agreement. So nope, that's you know, fine. It's, uh, I think if we, we had an, an expectation for them to report back more frequently, then that would be set at this table for... I, I didn't have an expectation of them reporting back. It was more of an informal talk to uh, share anything else yeah. other than a formal talk. Right. Did you have a further but question? Just, just planting a seed. <laughs> um, and the other thing is I'm just very much looking forward to see what the business vehicles are that you're looking at with regards to early next year. So uh, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Neil. And, and just part, lastly on that topic about Councillor how do they raise, I do know, though, that Neil, you and your team are very approachable. So. Um, yeah, I've heard from others, um, so if Councillor Heller or others caught up with you for a phone call or so forth, yeah. I'm sure that you'd yeah, be happy sure. to have a chat about certain aspects of that. Um, I just want to check whether there's anyone via Zoom that's got their hand up. Yeah. Okay, Councillor McCann, good morning. Morena, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for that, Neil. I was just um, uh, focusing on my usual issue the housing and needs assessment with that work um, heading towards completion early next year, how are you going to be strategising with the council to lobby and advocate for increased investment in that space? Oh, that's a good question. Um, we're actually, um, we're th through um, Chris Claridge, who's, who's, who's um, been identified as our sort of spokesperson on this or, or the person responsible for it, um, for, for, for creating that within the group, is he's met with various people and just really pulling together the, the, the pieces of, of, of how we might approach that. So it's a work in progress, um, and and you know we're not quite in the position to be able to sort of um, clarify exactly you know what that approach is going to be. Thank you. That's all for me. Thank you, Rob. Um, so I, Angela, I, Councillor Buzzwell, I think your light was up earlier. Was there another? And that's okay. All right. I don't see any other questions around the table. I've got a couple just myself. Um, the first one was just that the just the corridor we had earlier around the energy related stuff. I'm sure you're aware of the group in Autaki Energize Autaki. And although they've done some smaller projects, they are quite aspirational about some very much bigger projects. So I just wanted to um, at least check or, or um, ask whether you've made contact with them or whether you'll be willing to meet with them and just um, hear their vision in terms of. Yeah, excellent. And they're happy to make that connection there if um, if the team want to. I think I see Councillor Elliott sort of moving forward in a seat. There's another group in Autaki which at the same time I can make you aware of as well. Um, or or Councillor Elliott can, either one of us. Um, thanks, Jackie. Um, the second one was in relation to the report and it's, it's potentially probably for staff. There was a lot of criticism at the time when we approved a Te Urihi project around the... Um, demise of tourism and I'm interested in the report um, just looking at page 30 where it says that our domestic tourism increased 12.5% compared to 7.3% in the Wellington region and 5.4% nationally. That's quite extraordinary. I don't know whether staff want to talk to that and I guess the importance um, or the role that we play in terms of the stuff that we're delivering including to Urtahi um, and responding to that domestic tourism. Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Yes, that's we're all surprised by that, um, and so we did do some looking deeper and um, chatting with Infometrics as well, just to try and understand what is going on beyond people being trapped, if you like, in our district during those lockdown periods. We've studied market view, consumer spending as well. So it, it really does appear that um, some of the marketing campaigns have spiked interest because Kiwis can only look, look for their um, tourism fix locally. So it, it's a combination of things also promoting the local businesses. So for, to, to see $108 million spent over 12 months by tourists up to June is, is is a very encouraging uh, sign for all of our tourism players, our Airbnbs, um, our few motels, and possibly for a vision of having a hotel as well. So it, it's, it's, all, it's all good stuff. We can't say we're totally clear on what's happening. We do know anecdotally that all sorts of really good things are happening. Uh, Airbnbs are full, for example, and they were full during periods we didn't think they would be full either with the restrictions. So. The DMP has landed just at the right time. 
the marketing activity that comes out of that plan, the regional work we're doing with Wellington NZ is, is only going to support and strengthen uh, those sectors. Um, it doesn't mean that hospitality is doing particularly well yet, but that will be a, a flow-on effect um, of, of the good signs that we're seeing. Thank you, Mark, and I think it's great to hear that um, tourism isn't dead. Um, Darren, I, saw, I see that you're just about to... I was going to say, it is a really difficult period to understand exactly what all the things are going on, but definitely in terms of all the signs we've seen in terms of consumer spending and all those sorts of things, so that there is a really positive activity in the current market. You, know, you do get good feedback from different you know, companies that you talk to in terms of what's happening, and definitely the ability for people to travel domestically is a big thing because international travel and all those sorts of things is not accessible at the moment. So you know, definitely there's lots of things to really capitalise on and you know, what's Mark saying in terms of the work that's going on to really try and promote the district but build some momentum and provide more facilities and stuff like that is really crucial to keep that going. Excellent. Thanks, Darren. Look, I think that's it. I don't see any further questions um, from the table. I want to thank um, both you, Neil, and Scott for taking the time and your um, busy lives to come here and to present to us today and be available to answer questions. Um, I've continually heard great um, things about the work that the Kotahitanga board is doing, but also I've got the ED team in the room as well, or some of them, um, likewise with the, the um, grunt and the talent that we've got to council around the ED team as well. So, um, you know, following on from the legacy of Darren, now to you, Mark, there's, um, we're certainly hearing good feedback from people in terms of the um, the capability within that team to support um, business and, and I'd like to think that some of the stuff that we're seeing through now is reflected of the work that's been put in there um, and the team that's been developed there, Wayne, as well. So um, uh, we're going to move to the formal part of the paper in terms of the recommendations. I, th I understand you two need to slip away anyway. You've got some other commitments. Um, so thanks very much for attending. And I think councillors, we can remove our masks once they remove... Oh, we've got... Oh, no. OK. <laughs> all good, all good. Um, so the um, recommendations are found on page 27. Um, recommendation 8. Councillor Buzzwell, do I check it whether you would like to? I mean, that's still appropriate, isn't it? It's just as efficient. Yep. Um, moved by Councillor Buzzwell, seconded by Councillor Elliott. Um, right of introduction, and I'll open it up for debate. Um, I think that a lot of it's already been said around the table in support of um, the work that the Kotahi Tanga Board has been doing over the last um, sort of, I don't know, 12 months since they've been um, had their feet under the table. So I would just like to acknowledge that formally and a thank you to the Board for the efforts um, for our Kapiti Coast community, business community. Thank you. Anyone in debate? Right. Okay, I'd just like to add a little bit, um, just following on from, oh, Your Worship. Yeah, um, it's been a long time gestation. They say an elephant take two years to gestate. This has been more than a herd of elephants. And so it's been really good. Um, but one of the things I want to remind councillors was there was some angst upon, on the part of councillors that they wanted to have more control or input into how the board was working. Um, uh, it, was, it has been good that the board has been able to get on with this work without too much um, interference, if you like, from elected members. It allows time to mature and come to us with, with good ideas. So well done to all the people who made that possible. Thank you. Thank you. And look, I guess there's lots of sayings that I could use. Um, Rome wasn't built in a day. It was, you know, sort of one. Um, learn to walk before you run. Certainly, we've, I think I heard an elected member say either today or the other day that the board is coming into its stride. Um, and we're certainly seeing some more deliverables um, as we're now in um, this six-month reporting period. So I've been very impressed with um, the work that they've done. Um, certainly, Neil's openness to discuss what he can discuss, appreciating some of it. Um, as confidential, so for example, the um, the food business that's gone into the old Fonterra, um kept that under wraps for a little bit until it was confirmed, and that's the nature of some commercial sensitivities when we're in this sort of um, this area. So um, again, I, I think that we're very fortunate to have the people that we have on the board and the work we're doing, but also um, not ignoring the team around them and and, and Mark's team and, and Darren and so forth around the ED team. So. Um, I think we're definitely starting to see those results coming through. So I don't see any other lights up. Um, I'd, what right of reply? 
Um, I was just also just wanted to add there was some um, talk about the conflict between housing and arable land in our community, and I think that the project that the Kotahitanga Board are working really hard is the regenerative um, horticulture through iwi and so forth. I think that that will highlight or give examples of how our land can be productive and eventually turn into an income. And I think that over the last few years, a lot of um, horticulture has ceased in our area because it's not financially viable in small plots. So I think that that regenerative um, project that they're doing works across so many different aspects of, um, of what we're talking about with, uh, with our land use, which I think is really good. Thanks, um, Councillor Buswell, and we'll come back to that land discussion when Jason and the team come to the table. I think I read the wrong recommendation number out earlier because I clicked on the wrong tab. Well, recommendation 20, it's been moved and seconded, page 31. I'm going to put that to the vote. All those in favour say aye. Aye. aye against, and that is carried. Um, I am keen to move on to the next item, but if elected members insist on a break, we can stop for a few minutes. I just know that it's never just a few minutes. So can we press on for this one and then break after... Um, Jason and his team come up around the housing bill submission. So, Angela, Jason, thank you. And so we are now on to item number 7.1. Morena. There we go. Excellent. So I'm going to hand it over to Angela to um, walk us through. Uh, morning, Nakoto. Um, apologies from Natasha. She wasn't able to make it up from town today, so um, uh, you get me for the introduction as well. Um, she just had wanted to mention, um, as a kind of by way of introduction to this the bill that we're currently dealing with, um, it is um, it was somewhat of a surprise, um, and the government is looking to push this through by the end of the year. Uh, so they are running an incredibly truncated process. Um, submissions on this were due on Tuesday, and they started oral hearings on Monday, so the day before they were due, um, for those who had submitted early. So that's just an indication of exactly how fast this is going for us. Um, so um, we've tried to focus as much as we can in our submission on the things that we think we can change, but we have also provided some high level feedback on the direction that the government is seeking through this bill as well. Um, because we think there is some potential for some negative impacts on Kapiti and the way we do our planning. Um, that said, the overall intent of enabling more housing is one that we agree with. Um, and it's, and um, as a response to the housing crisis, and it's, but what, we, what we're seeing is an incredibly blunt tool that we have some really serious concerns about so I will, what I'm going to do is run you through some brief um, summary of what the changes are proposed, because um, uh, apologies again that you guys didn't get the submission until late last night before, um, before today. It's just what timing allowed, unfortunately. So I will step you through um, what, what the bill is proposing and then talk to what our main messages are from our submission, and then we can open up to questions from there. So the intent of the bill is indeed to speed up the implementation of the intensification policies in the National Policy Statement on Urban Development. Um, and it requires medium density residential standards to go into plans. I'll talk more about those shortly. So the timing, as I said, currently before the Environment Committee, um, submissions have closed. They're already doing hearings. Um, we are currently seeking to do an oral submission on Friday afternoon, I believe. We're still working through the details on that. Uh, we've been confirmed at 4.20 p.m. on Friday. Yeah. Nice. We did get the option of Saturday if that didn't work out. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I'm coming from up a hut. Oh. It's all on Zoom these days. Um, so yeah, the government is intending to pass the bill by the end of the year, and it is going to require that council implement the provisions 
and a plan change that needs to be notified by August 2022. So this is a year ahead of the timing that we had been working to under the NPSUD before this bill came out. So what it's proposing is a faster and more wide-reaching implementation of the NPSUD. So as I mentioned, we're doing it a year quicker in Tier 1 councils than we had previously been working to. And it's also taking the intensification requirements of the NPSUD and um, applying those a bit more broadly. So it's looking at around centres rather than just around rapid transit stops. So the core of what they're proposing is the application of some medium density residential standards. So this is what you've probably heard talk about in terms of um, three three-storey houses per lot, which is kind of um, the key change that they're proposing. So um, the provisions are expected to apply across residential areas, and you will be able to put three three-storey dwellings on a site um, without resource consent as a permitted activity. There are some provisions around height, um, height limits and setbacks and yard requirements and those sorts of things that do mean that it's not literally every section, but the general idea is that you will be able to have reasonable, um, reasonably high medium density housing provided for across residential areas in Tier 1 um, districts and cities. There are also no minimum lots, uh, site sizes for subdivision. So previously in most district plans, councils provide a minimum lot size um, and they often are dependent on exactly where it is that you're planning on subdividing. But in, this, in the areas where the medium density residential standards apply, you'll be able to subdivide down to any, um, any size that you want, basically. Can I, can I jump in with a question here through the chair? Uh, we normally wait till the end. I'm not sort of picking, singling you out and going, but can, can it wait till the end or do oh, you? It's, it's on that specific the minimum type sizes. Okay, so I'm going to just check with staff whether they want to, otherwise we'll just... Um, you can too. Okay, but if it starts happening every one, then I'm going to call, <laughs> it, call it off. So um, go for it. Cool. Um, through the chair, in terms of the no minimum site sizes for subdivision, so technically there, there's minimums that are built in because you've got to be able to meet the setbacks, the recession planes, all those things, the outdoor spaces and all that. It's just that there's not a, a set lot um, size like we currently have or, or other councils currently have. Um, but also, because there's not a resource consent required for subdivision, oh sorry, there's not a resource consent required for the dwellings, there's not necessarily a subdivision that's going to take place. So you end up with three dwellings on one, one lot regardless of that. So is that correct? Is that, in my understanding, sort of broadly correctly? Yes, so you still require resource consent for subdivision, division, but you're right. Um, to build three houses on a section, you don't need to subdivide. It's, you can put three houses there of right. So, um, yeah. But what gets really scary, <laughs> councillor, is depending on the size of your lots, you might subdivide it three times and then put three buildings on each of those subdivided lots with no minimum lot size. So you've still so, got to comply so with all those of, and stuff. Of the, yeah, you've still got to comply with that, but instead of seeing um, three three-storey units, if the six, excuse me, if the section could allow it, maybe there's nine or twelve. There's some really scary diagrams that people have put out about what a um, developer could try to achieve to maximise um, effectively what happens on a piece of land. And um, yes, they will have to apply for subdivision, um, but but it's going to be quite a struggle for us to deal with the consequences of that intensity potentially. Um, yes, it will become very difficult to anticipate the um, development potential of subdivision requests when they come in. You almost have to start assuming that there will be three by three put on them if that's practical um, because assuming the standard one dwelling won't necessarily give you an accurate in um, indication of what you might be getting. Um, right, so moving on. The other... Um, key part of the bill is they, they are creating an intensification streamlined planning process which councils must use to implement the MDRS that we were just talking about. So the key points of this planning process um, is that um, the provisions will have immediate legal effect as soon as they're notified, so normally you have to go through a whole um, process before provisions will have legal effect in plan, um, but in this case they will have immediate legal effect on notification. Um, they will provide opportunities for Māori, iwi and public participation. 
um, but there are no appeal rights at the end. So um, this is somewhat similar to the streamlined planning process that we have already seen through the previous RM reforms. Um, and the diagram at the bottom is just kind of a, a general indication of the, um, the steps and how that changes. So the key point being um, that you, uh, the plan change is considered by an independent um, panel, which is not uncommon, that's often what happens. Um, they make recommendations back to council. If council agrees with the recommendations, it just notifies the decision and then we're basically done at that point. However, if we disagree with the decision, it goes to the minister and the minister makes the final decision on um, what goes into the plan. So that's a very brief overview, but it is um, the key points being that there are no appeal rights at the end. The, int the intention of that is to make it easier to get them in and to speed up the process so that the provisions are in plans sooner, because quite often the appeals part, as we're all aware, um, slow down plan making processes. So the key messages in our submission, I appreciate our submission was quite long. Um, it is in two parts, the front being the kind of high level policy um, changes and the back part being the technical submission. Um, I'm mostly focusing on the front part. Um, so uh, the key message is that what they're proposing in this bill is too blunt of a tool to help us um, grow well in our district. So we need a more nuanced approach to allow us to direct growth to the areas where um, we think are most suitable, where our infrastructure is either in place or, or planned to support it, and where we think that we can create resilient, thriving communities um, with those supports that wrap around them. Applying uh, intensification across the district makes those things really difficult for us to achieve. The second key message is let us do more. So the, um, the ISPP process is quite restrictive in the things that we're allowed to include in it. So the process itself is great in that it lets you um, get through the plan change process quickly. It deals with public consultation up front rather than appeal rights at the end and these things are all good. But um, it's quite restrictive in the way that we're allowed to use it. We're only allowed to use it once. Um, we can only use it for certain provisions and anything that falls outside of that has to go through a separate plan change process. So what we're looking at is having to split out what would have been our um, urban development plan change that gave effect to the MPCUD and do that in two parts. So one being through an ISPP that with all of the bits that we were able to include and then a second one later on through a standard planning process with all of the bits that fell out of that process. Um, so it also doesn't allow us to include certain provisions that we think would be really helpful, particularly around papakaianga housing. Um, they would largely fall outside of the scope of the process at the moment, so we have um, sought inclusion of that through our submission. Um, another key message is that we need um, our infrastructure to be there to support our growth. Uh, one of the key things around our growth strategy is being able to plan for and provide our infrastructure in the right timing um, in order to support that growth and for us as a council to be able to afford to do all of those things. We can't, we can't provide infrastructure capacity everywhere across the district all at once um, and still be able to fund that in a reasonable way. Um, we need to be able to plan and prioritise and our ability to do that, to do that is going to be really hampered by the ability for significant intensification across our centres in our district. Um, and also there are some challenges in the way that we currently raise um, funds for infrastructure. So development contributions are one of the main ways that we fund um, growth based infrastructure and there are some ch when you do not require resource consent for um, intensification it becomes really hard for us to levy development contributions and to get those funds in a timely manner. Um, normally you would get those up front and, in this, um, and it seems likely that we would have to wait until building consent when you already have to have really built the infrastructure to be able to get that money. So it um, creates some real challenges in the way that we can plan for and fund the infrastructure that's required to support growth. So that is quite a core cool message in, um, in both our submission and submissions more broadly by councils that we've seen. It's a really major concern. Um, another key message we have is it's, there's some ways in which it's really unclear how the proposed changes in the bill will actually work with our existing plan. And um, so we've sought some clarification around some 
provisions. Um, one of the key, without wanting to get too technical, one of the key parts of applying the um, medium density residential standard is that there are some qualifying matters that allow you to make those standards less permissive. So if there are sort of um, factors around natural hazards and things like that, you can say actually it's not appropriate to apply those provisions to that area because um, there's natural hazard risk that makes that intensification inappropriate. Um, there are some hoops to jump through to be able to use those provisions and it's a little bit unclear about how we can actually practically use, um, manage that within our existing plan where we use what are called district-wide provisions that apply um, for the likes of natural hazards and other things. So there's some technical stuff we need to work through there about how the functionality of our plan works with those. Um, and another real concern we have, which is similar, is whether or not we can continue to require hydraulic neutrality through the district plan. Currently that's something we do manage, um, again through district-wide provisions, and it's just really unclear exactly how we can continue, whether we can and how we can continue to provide for that in our um, district plan. Apologies, that's one that's a little bit technical, but we can get to questions on that afterwards if we need to. Um, and I think what is my last key message is that it might actually slow us down. So um, Jason and the team have had a work program on implementing the, um, the MPSUD that has had everything kind of laid out for how we were going to achieve the timeframes that we had been given. Um, and because of the nature of the um, ISPP process and other things, it is actually likely that some of the parts of the plan um, which we would have Sort in, we would have sought intensity in some areas, it's actually going to have to wait till that second plan change now for us to get there. So it's going to delay some of the changes that we already had in chain um, in order to be able to make it work. So it's not actually going to necessarily um, give the government the, the additional speed that they're looking for for intensification through plans. It might actually slow us down. Um, and of course, it's also going to increase the cost of implementing these decisions to council. Um, one other thing that I might briefly mention that is in our submission is around the um, interaction with the Takutai Kapiti process and there are some challenges in the timeframes of working through the community uh, community led process and what we are going to be required to do through the um, through this bill in terms of managing for climate change so um, yeah so that is another area where it's going to create some um, it's timing difficulties and not necessarily going to be meeting the intent of what they're really looking to achieve through this bill if I'm right. Oh, that was the end. Um, so yeah, so I think now we can throw it open to questions. Um, I do have down the back, I'll just, um, you all know Jason, but we've also got Andrew Banks from Boffer Miskell, who has, which is why we're wearing masks still. Um, <laughs> he, um, he's not contagious, it's just the <laughs> rules around mask wearing. Um, and he's been our, he's our lead planner on the NPCD plan change that we're running, and he's also been the main technical input into the provisions that you will have seen in the submission. And we've also got Jen, who um, I have to credit for doing most of the wrangling on pulling this submission together and in a, a short time frame, which has been amazing. So we can throw the technical questions down the end, but happy to... Um, Thank you. I'll see if there's any of Andrew, and if there's not, we can kick him out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, look, before we go to questions, I do want to check, because I know that um, I've, I've certainly at least had these discussions with our chief executive. I know others. I've heard others um, talking as well. Uh, Wayne, whether you could explain... I guess give an example of what bad could look like in terms of that infrastructure cost and uh, you know potentially what that could mean to our ratepayers and to this table. Thank you Mr Chair for that unexpected opportunity. <laughs> 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 Buckle in. Um, so um, we have all sorts of statutory obligations for how we plan and fund and deliver our work. This has just trampled on it completely. Um, the, uh, the analysis done by PwC and Sense Partners suggests that by allowing much more infill, councils are going to save money because they're not going to need to build infrastructure for greenfield development. Um, I humbly submit that is not going to be the case. Um, developers who have bought a piece of land are not going to sit back and go in greenfield space, oh, you know what, I'll just hold off while the council and the government spend 10 years doing infill alone. I'll hold off doing my development. Um, I think you can all see that is not going to be the case. So we're going to be obliged to do both. We don't currently know um, at what point of intensification will it, the capacity of our existing infrastructure run out. 
I couldn't tell you right now what our capacity is in Paraparaumu. Um, Sean maybe would have a go at it, but I'm not going to ask him right now. That's a piece of work we're going to have to update. The previous HBA suggested that of the 24,000 infill development that was technically possible across our district, about 4,000 was economically realisable and feasible and people might do it. So that's what we've always worked towards. I currently have no idea what the number will be, but I think we all expect it'll be much higher now through this permissive approach. Um, so even though we built our infrastructure in the 70s and we allowed for capacity for growth, at a certain point it's going to run out and, I, and, and my concern would be that this is going to cause it to run out in an unplanned and unstructured way. Uh, some of you might have heard Steve Evans, the um, Chief Executive at Fletcher Building, say councils could refuse to connect new developments to their infrastructure once they run out. Um, that's not in our nature to want to do that, but that's a realistic appraisal of so what happens when there is no more capacity? So um, back of an envelope, um, let's just say in Paraparaumu, we hit that capacity and we need to build new infrastructure. We've, we've guesstimated 90 to $100 million of um, water and, in particular, water and pipes and um, a little bit of roading would probably need to be added into that now that you don't need to provide car parking either. Um, so so um, that could be to provide a few thousand more houses in Paraparaumu. Um, because we're a string of pearls, um, in an overly simplistic and um, highly um, uh, adversarial way, provocative way, we could multiply that by four. So this council could be um, committed to $400 million worth of unplanned infrastructure on top of the $1.5 billion that's in our 20-year LTP. But we can't do it because we didn't consult on it with our community. So because it's not in our plan, we can't build it in theory. We're going to have to potentially amend the LTP put that $400 million in, it is, a, it is a speculative high-level number, of course. Remember that our current debt's about $150 million. And we have no way to collect that money. So Angela very um, politely stepped through that. Um, I'll be a little bit more provocative. Um, uh, we collect DCs and FCs when we issue resource consent primarily, and that's at the beginning of the process. So we've committed that $400 million of expenditure. The government just took away our ability to collect that money back and said, well, that's OK, you can get it when the house owner, at the end of the process, wants a CTC for their house. Now, I don't know about you, but when you've committed to buying land and, and get a house built on it, and then the council drops a $25,000 bill on you at the end of the process and says, thank you very much, would you please pay me? Pretty sure we're going to um, be looked upon very fondly by that house owner. Not. So, um, and, and very hard to collect at that late point as well. So now we'll be doing it at an individual house owner level, trying to collect it years after the expenditure was incurred. So um, y you can tell that from a financial perspective, I'm extremely concerned about the impacts on councils who are now going to have to not only work with developers on the greenfields infrastructure, but depending on your individual circumstances across the country, upgrade your existing infrastructure to cope with this extra capacity without any ability to plan ahead for it, without any ability to fund it, um, and that will make our lives better. <laughs> so I, th I think part of the example you gave when you and I were talking about it was, say for example, the waste water treatment plant, expanding that. We talked about $100 million, even on the conservative end, that would start pushing us up to the close to our debt cap. Um, with uh, very little to no ability to collect that other than, as you said, to the homeowner after they've already mortgaged themselves up to the hilt to pay for their land and home package, um, so then to be collected from district-wide ratepayers. Um, so there is issues around our um, debt levels, and to add to that, you may have part of our income removed through the three waters being taken away as well. So, you know, that it, looking at the bigger picture, it does get quite messy quite quickly. Um, so thanks for that, Wayne. I think um, that covered most of, of of that stuff. I was just trying to think in terms of the debt, in terms of the infrastructure, um, the unplanned nature of it. But just remembering back to what was said at the start, we, this council, is not anti-intensity um, and, and increased housing. It's actually just um, thinking through the... I guess the unintended consequences. Before I move to full questions, I just want to check with the team down the back, Jason and, and others, is there anything you wanted to add before we open up for questions? No, no you're all good. 
All right, Councillor Compton, I see your first cab off the rank. So, um, and just remember we had a question from Councillor Pravanov that's not directly related, but just while the team's in the room, we can cover that one off as well around the rural aspect. Over to you, Gwen. Uh, thank you. Through the chair, a couple of questions from me. I guess the first one's just picking up on the discussion we just had around those financial challenges. I guess rather than challenges, given all the other changes that are going on, and I think we can accept the status quo for local government isn't going to be the status quo going forward, given we've got three waters, given we've got RMA reform, given we've got the review into the future for local government. I mean, isn't these sort of issues an opportunity for us to go in really loudly and say, look, you need to actually fix the funding for local government across the board because you're changing everything. And this is another example of where you're changing the game, but not not helping us actually fund the things that we need to do to enable this sort of stuff. Good question, Gwen. I'll hand it over to Wayne. 100%, Councillor. Totally agree. Um, look, our concern, though, is, of course, you know, um, I would like to give credit to the team for in a few short weeks, um, it's probably less than weeks, they've pulled all this together. And that's an example of what's wrong with this, that, that the parties have been working on it, we understand, since January and would not engage with anyone in local government because that's how highly they regard our contribution. Um, but you're absolutely right. The big game here is that, but, but it's when it's landed on us so fast, we're in reactive mode. They want this being delivered by next year. Um, there's no way there's going to be a funding um, resolution in that short period of time. So I, I worry that things will get worse as we're having the debate. But 100% agree with you. This is yet another uh, good piece of ammunition for that funding debate. And good question, Gwen, and while I agree with you, I think if we think back to our submission that we made uh, to the Productivity Commission, the key point there is what, if they listen um, and if they deliver on what you're suggesting is the opportunity around the funding and financing model. So I'm um, just check of you another question. I'll behave myself and not venture my thoughts on the uh, the Productivity Commission. Um, I guess my second question, and it picks up on, on just the tail end of that, I guess in terms of when these provisions come into effect, we're realistically not going to suddenly wake up the next day and find three storey, three dwellings appearing on every lot because there are constraints in the building sector in terms of uh, they need to train up the staff to do this sort of stuff. You know, a lot of builders are primarily focused on single storey buildings. Going to three storeys means different materials, different approaches from them. Um, even bank financing is going to have to change to allow this sort of development um, to take place because there'll be a lot more smaller developers presumably trying to to play this game as well. So I guess what's the sort of view on how quickly we might see this, these plan changes actually result in more houses? I know the government's got a view in terms of how it will happen, but I, I was listening this morning on, um, I think it was News Talk ZB, and they hadn't even considered sort of the impacts from construction and demolition waste coming out of this. And you can picture a lot of people will bowl an existing house and put three in its place. Um, so do we, do we have any sort of hunch on that, or is that just another one of these things where it's sort of like they've been working on this since January but they haven't considered that sort of impact on it? Yeah, I think um, the very short answer is we don't know. We can have some hunches around exactly what you've talked about, constraints in the building sector, lack of materials, all of those types of things, and people still um, will see an opportunity and it takes time for them to work through that process and figure out what exactly it is that they can do. But the real challenge is that we is the fact that we don't know. So these things can crop up at any time without us being able to plan for it as the challenge. So even though it might take, um, you know, five five years for the bulk of this type of thing to actually have been built and to occur, uh, the issue is that we're not going to see we're not going to see it and know that it's coming and be able to prepare for that and um, make sure that all of the rest of the supports required to support that growth are in place. So that's the um, that's the real key, I think. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Gwen. Oh, I was, um, yeah. the, the, the interesting thing, which isn't exactly answering your question, though, is that I personally believe they've now pushed up land prices mm -hmm. and, what's more, away from city centres and hubs. Um, and you've seen some reference to that in the documentation around what actually happened in Auckland. And um, uh, th this goes back to um, s some of the people pushing this policy are saying, no, it won't. And you've heard me say before, just because someone says something doesn't make it so. Uh, I worry that, that what you'll see now is, is attractive lots popping up on the market, price being pushed up because of what they can yield, mm. and then no development happening for a few years because the banking conditions are actually getting quite hard now. Mm. The banks are locking down. Mm. So, yeah, it's a good point you raise about timing, but there are other implications too.
and keeping an eye on that market, I would say that that is actually what is happening. So, from just from my experience, um, your worship. A um, couple of questions. The first one is to the chief executive. Um, given the how rapidly this has been uh, imposed, uh, there would be fish hooks left, right, and centre. Are we possibly anticipating legal challenges and counsel being caught in those? I think, I think the only thing I'd be comfortable with is the courts are going to be testing lots of this. Um, Any time you do something quite so dramatic, there'll be people who like and don't like. Um, mm. I do think um, the, the setbacks, the recession planes, and, and, and the, is, there, is it a one metre limit in terms of the view out your window? Um, I think that some of the stuff that's going to be permitted, um, when it starts to happen, people are going to come to us and say, how dare you allow okay. that? So that's not a court challenge, but that's going to um, further uh, degrade the reputation of the council as an organisation for allowing these things to happen when we didn't. So yes, there'll be court cases testing out provisions that I can't even see coming yet, and there will also be um, uh, neighbours at war. Mm. Okay, um, my next question, I'm looking at Part A, Policy Matters, Manofenua Aspirations. Uh, my understanding from Manafena, who are the leading edge of interfacing with council in terms of Papakainga housing, that uh, there is starting to evolve some views that the current bill may be useful to achieve their ends, um, and, and it depends on the definition of Papakainga housing, which the, we may have a particular definition of it which we think is theirs, but they may be signalling to us that that's not necessarily true. And therefore, they see this as enabling um, multi-generational lots. Mm. Um, yes, you, you're quite correct. So what the bill does allow is some forms of um, exactly that. You might end up having uh, three lots, uh, three houses built on a section that actually ends up to be multi-generational housing, which is one way of expressing that type of um, Papakai housing. I think our concern around the provisions in the bill, and I'll throw it to the um, technical expert shortly, but um, is that it doesn't provide, it's quite narrow in what we're able to provide for in the bill. So um, if it, um, and it depends on the kind of current zoning and use of the land as to whether or not it can be um, provided for. So what we're seeking is some broadening of the scope of the ISPP so that uh, more interpretations of Papakanga housing and in different locations can be incorporated into our district plan provisions through the ISPP process, rather than the narrow restrictive um, uh, scope of what we're able to provide for um, under the current bill drafting. Um, do you have anything to add down there, Andrew? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so I guess the key issue with um, Papakanga provisions is that um, papakanga are not always just about housing and um, modern papakanga provisions and district plans and I think a good example would be the proposed Porirua district plan can provide for activities in addition to housing such as cultural activities, community activities and even um, uh, business activities within the papakanga um, activity definition and so under the bill as written um, you, if, if that was the kind of papakainga that you were looking to include in the district plan, you would not be able to include that in the intensification streamlined planning process. The other issue as well is that um, papakainga provisions can often apply to um, uh, zones that aren't just urban zones, for example, rural zones, which is um, often where Māori freehold land is located. And the, the intensification streamlined planning process won't let you put new provisions into a rural zone. So those, those are the kind of, of, of issues that, that the submission was trying to address. Thank you. Just before I move to Councillor Holborough, I just don't want to forget that there was the question asked by Councillor Pravanov earlier. So Jason, I, I saw you nodding before, maybe you either wanted to respond to that. Sure. So, as I understand it, the question was, what does the district plan do to sort of protect highly productive land? And, and the answer is, the plan as it is now does have provisions to, 
to protect uh, the, the productive capacity of rural land um, and, and they are uh, provisions that come through in like a subdivision application context so there are policy directives that do offer some protection already. Um, we are aware of further national direction coming uh, on highly productive land, I think we had a briefing about that uh, well, many moons ago and it's still in the kind of never never but we understand it is still uh, an idea of government to progress a national policy statement for highly productive land. Um, and of course you've got a growth strategy which feedback closes on uh, this Friday I believe and um, future choices about where large areas of greenfield might be located. Uh, one of the factors about whether it goes here or there is going to be what will the impact be on, on the productive capacity uh, of, you know, the, the relative productivity of different pieces of land will be a factor in, in councils thinking about that, I'm sure. Thanks, Jason. Um, Councillor Pravanov. Thanks, Janet. Thank you, Jason, for that comment, uh, your comments. So you were talking about um, highly productive land in the rural area, but I think that the real conflict is where that highly productive land is in the urban area. And in terms of how, you know, so I know, and this is in the public arena, that, that council has bought some of that land for housing. And, you know, how, you know, what other, you know, and that's because it's able, council is able to do that. And obviously so are developers. So what protection um, could be in, um, put in place to actually um, stop that land being taken over by housing? I think in terms of the land, I'll come to you, but I think in terms of the land that Council purchased was covered both in the briefing and in the paper in terms of um, the challenges and the approach. But Jason, I'm going to just come to you and then I'm going to move on to the next speaker from there. I just want to get into the debate. Thank you. So th there's a difference, I guess, between a, a individual lot or, or a couple of lots, small areas of highly productive land, and, and the ability for that to be productive, as opposed to large areas of highly productive land, which have a greater capacity to uh, be used for productive purposes. So I think it's something to always keep in mind when you're looking at this issue. Um, is it already fragmented and therefore kind of limited in its practical use or is it a very large cohesive area and it really does still retain a lot of value for productive purposes? That's something that Council is going to have to grapple with as it, as it looks at how it wants to grow. Thanks Jason. I'm going to move on from there um, partly because we're going to have the discussion around the growing well growth strategy and I think other elected members we can bring that discussion more back into um, uh, at that point when we're discussing that piece of work. Um, Councillor Holborough. Thank you. Um, I do share the concerns that have been raised already. Um, I think this is quite rushed and I, I just, yeah, I, I, I fear for the ramifications for our Council. The um, submission refers quite a lot to qualifying matters and I've looked up the qualifying matters in the Act and it seems um, pretty broad and pretty loose, particularly I think it's 77I, the later part where it talks about um, you know, identifying special you know, considerations. So, um, what, what do you think? What do you think the? I mean, to, to me, that's going to be what makes this whole thing quite messy. Do you have any comments on that? Um, I will largely throw it down to Andrew on that, but um, so the qualifying matters, um, you're right, they do, they have a list of them. They're largely around applying the current section six matters, which allows for natural hazards and those types of things, but there is the catch-all at the end. I think our main challenge with that catch-all is that um, in doing the ISPP process, um, we'll have to do a, a section 32 analysis, which has to provide a, um, 
justification for all of those things. So um, it's quite a lot of work to go through to uh, figure out exactly what qualifying matters we think we're going to need to have in there and go through the process to be able to justify them all and hope that they get accepted. Um, but I'll pass it down to Andrew to give a more um, detailed description of those. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. Um, I, yeah, you're right, the qualifying matters issue is um, quite complex. Um, in the first instance, what we'll be looking to do with qualifying matters is use use qualifying use that part of the bill to deal with the uh, district-wide um, matters um, such as natural hazards, uh, flood things like flooding, um, ecological sites, uh, sites of significance to mana whenua. Those issues that are already dealt with through the district plan um, in a logical way will will be using to, uh, will be trying to use the qualifying matters aspects of the bill to, to ensure that they continue to um, apply. Um, but that said, we've got to do quite a bit of work technically to, to um, work out how we can actually do that. Um, so um, we've actually sought as part of the bill, uh, the submission on the bill clarification that we can in fact continue to, to um, deal with those issues as qualifying matters. So yeah, there's quite a bit of work to do. May I, Mr. Chair? Yeah, we've had um, Andrew clarifying the qualifying. Now we've got the chief executive. <laughs> just, just on the same matter, um, you know, broadly, what I've heard Minister Parker say is, um, look, anything zone residential um, needs to be allowed to, to permit, as of right, this intensification. So, you know, as a politician is is allowed to do, they stay at the high level and go, that's what we're trying to achieve, and we don't want nimbyism. So we don't want even all these little pockets of people saying so for this qualifying matter, um, I'm excluded, and two, two streets away, I'm excluded, but in between, go fill your boots. So in their, in their um, sort of oversimplified version of the world, I think they really want to say it's anything that's zoned residential, with a few exceptions. I think the reality that every council is going to have to work through is understanding um, what you can and can't do um, and include as a qualifying matter. And that's a concern, because that's the sort of thing, going to the Mayor's point, that will get challenged. So I think the point that I hear at it is probably less qualifying than more qualifying in terms of what they're trying to achieve. Um, Councillor Holward, did you have anything further? Yeah, so just following on from that, so for instance, the long drawn out process that we just went through to create the special character zone for Waikanae, that's just out the window, is it? Um, I'm going to throw that to Andrew. <laughs> Um, not necessarily. So uh, you referred actually to 77I before. Um, so there is a possibility to um, define certain things as other qualifying matters, um, but the level of evidence required to support that is very high. Um, and in particular, 77I talks about site-specific, site-by-site analysis to demonstrate that that qualifying matter should continue to um, exist. So there is a very high evidence threshold to, to um, demonstrate that um, issues such as, as that um, can continue to apply as a qualifying matter. So that sounds like that it might actually create more work having to do site-by-site -site analyses rather than having identifying areas with certain characters. Would that be right? Yes, and the and needing to meet that threshold to justify maintaining the, the type of provisions that we've got could be, in general, really challenging for those type of character issues. Mm. Thank you. All right, I've got Councillor Elliott, then I've got Councillor Pravanov, and then I'll check in with Councillor McCann, who is possibly still online and may have some questions. So, Councillor Elliott. Um, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, Councillor Compton uh, raised a question around um, construction and demolition yeah. waste that I can add a tiny bit to answer that now, or I can wait till debate. It's up to you. Yeah, if you can hold it for debate, cause just because we've got a few had, in terms of time wise. What's that, sorry? What's that, sorry? Are we having debate? Because it's just an update. We don't actually have any resolutions to. Yeah, good point. I am um, in the throw of um, cheering, not thought of that. So. Um, um, look, I'm just wondering how helpful it'll be, maybe just in the Council of Zealand, Councillor Elliott, just for the elected members. I do want to just move things on. We're at quarter past 11. Sure. So not being disrespectful to your portfolio. Um, and uh, Councillor Pravanov. 
Thank you. Through uh, you, Mr Mayor. So I'm sort of following along from Council Holborough's questions, but I also wanted, so on top of you've got um, those, there's a number of natural character um, communities along the beachfront or in the, in the coastal areas, but then on top of that you've got the, um, the coastal adaptation work that is occurring, and in terms of the timing of when this has got to be put in place, but in terms of the, um, which is quicker than the coastal adap adaptation work, and how those two might work together or not, and what the implications are. Jason, I'll throw that one to you. Thanks. Yes, Councillor, look, that, that is an issue that we've noted uh, in the submission. It was an issue that was created initially by the National Policy Statement itself. So uh, the bill has, has just added to that, uh, really. Um, so we did kick off uh, with, with the idea that we wouldn't be going near coast in terms of the district plan and plan changes until after the Tuckatite Kapiti process had been completed and uh, we were going to be looking for that process to provide us with some sort of guidance as to within the, the realms of what we're allowed to do by the national direction on coastal management and regional direction as well um, just where should we land within that box of possibilities? So we were looking to Takatai Kapiti to, to help guide us in that regard. We still are. So but that's an important point to, to make, that the process is still going to be incredibly important for informing that coastal plan change, which um, is set out in the long-term plan. Um, we envisage uh, notifying in 2023. So that, that plan is still the plan. Um, but what we now are likely to need to do is to apply a qualifying matter um, in, in the course of the urban development plan change in 2022, which relates to the issue of, of coastal hazards. Now, we're going to have to apply qualifying matters in a spatial way. We're going to actually have to be very clear, because it's a planned process, we're going to, have to be very clear. Every person needs to know whether they have um, a certain set of planning provisions that prov uh, apply to them or, or a different set. And that's what planning maps are for. They're, they actually spatially make that clear at the property level. They have to, because we're talking about the application of regulations here. Um, so what that obviously creates is, is a situation where we're going to, as a council, have to talk about how do we decide where to uh, apply that coastal hazard qualifying matter in the course of developing the 2022 plan change. And it will need uh, to draw on the best available information. And, and that is likely to be the information that is generated for the Takatai Kapiti process. Now, we have noted in the submission, and I'm not sure that we can expect government to react and do anything particularly useful for us, but we thought it was a really important point to make, which was we're a bit worried that it's going to be read the wrong way, that when we have that conversation about where that qualifying matter should apply in the context of the coastal hazard question, that people are going to read that as meaning that there's been some prejudgment on council's part about what the solution is. Mm -hmm. How should land use management be managed alongside a bunch of other important uh, initiatives to, to address the, the coastal hazard problem? People may get the wrong impression that by applying that in the 2022 plan change, there's been some sort of call made um, ahead of the Takatai Kapiti process. It's really important that people understand that is not what would be the intent of doing that. Um, that. That whatever spatial areas are delineated for uh, that purpose in the 2022 urban development plan change, it, it's not about saying, and, and we already know what the answer is in a land use management district plan way for how that land within those areas should be managed. That is still needing to be informed by the Takatai Kapiti process. Now, this is a complicated narrative, and, and any time you have complicated narratives, uh, 
it's a, it's a tough thing to be able to get everybody to understand. So we have that task in front of us. Thanks, Jason, for that explanation. And I think it is a very pertinent point and probably something that we might be able to cover in our comms when we are talking about this, um, the impact of this on our community in terms of the, the bill. Um, Councillor Pravano. Yes, thank you. So I suppose following up on that, you have um, the conversations going on about limbs going on um, on property. So um, that, would you like to make some comment in terms of where that fits yeah. with all that, please? Councillor, can I just check, because I think we're deviating away from the actual bill itself, um, and I can hear uh, <laughs> um, the Chief Executive agreeing beside me. Um, that was my take on it. Jason, I, I think we just move on from there, because it's not relating particularly to the the update that we've got. Mr Chairman, I would suggest that uh, at some stage council staff are going to give us a briefing on the coastal matters. Even at better. That point, the is going to be All right, so councillor, we'll, we'll cover that off in a briefing around the the limbs, lines, coastal stuff um, uh, at a later date, but not too late, Sean? Yeah, all right, thank you. Um, now I've got councillor Holborough again. Yes, yeah, so, sorry, I, I didn't re I didn't kind of pick up either that there's no debate. So I'd just like to make one point, if I may, to you, Mr Chair. Well, if I allow you to make one point rather than a question, then I'm going to have to allow everyone else to make a point. So... Put a question <laughs> so Do you um, absolutely need to make the point? <laughs> I, I, I just think it's really important that it hasn't been raised during... And I, I, just, I just wanted to make sure that the considerations around climate change with this Act... Uh, pressed home when we make our verbal presentation because I think there are serious problems in terms of transport connectivity, in terms of... It, I don't think there's been a climate change lens really through this whole thing and I think that's... I'm, I'm sorry, I just think that's a really important point to make and it comes through in the submission but I'd really like it to be a major point that we make when we do our oral submission on Friday, and I don't know if others would agree with that. Thanks, Jenna. I've got a couple of questions myself, and um, before I do, Councillor Elliott circulated an email just around the construction way, so thank you, Jackie. I, I appreciate you doing that. Um, so from my perspective, the um, as an example, I think I'm just trying to think the term that you used, um, but with our requirement for freshwater tanks on new builds, how, does that, how would that fill in on a small site with three houses on it, then needing the space for tanks and is that is that one of those unintended consequences? When you talked about they could override our district plan provisions and So um, the provisions that are applied through the NDRS um, don't have any um, reference to that kind of thing. So the only the only requirements they have are around the um, the side setbacks and um, there's still a, I think, a 60% impervious surfaces um, maximum that you can have on your site. So there still has to be a level of space around you. Um, so to the extent that, for instance, the water tanks fit within um, in that scope, then um, that's fine. But it will be a real challenge for, um, for us when it comes to some of those questions about how we can actually practically implement that in the spaces that we're trying yeah, to kind exactly. of jigsaw around. Yeah, um, so that could be an example where it's challenging. further comment on that? No? You think? Yeah. I just think it's helpful to point out some of these things that they haven't thought of. Uh, yeah, that one might be... That might trigger... If they can't provide that storage, then that might then link to a resource consent application, I assume, potentially. I don't know, mm -hmm. another one of those complicating factors in terms of site coverage and their ability to provide that. If they're not going to provide it, then they'd have to apply to not comply. And to do that, they would have to put in a resource consent, I assume. I don't know how. So again, I guess this comes back to some of the points that Emily raised around the hydraulic neutrality, our requirements around freshwater um, tanks, and potentially other fish hooks like that that they, the government potentially hasn't thought about. And which goes to my next question around you talked about this could potentially slow us down. I, I take it that's the downside of the government not consulting with councils first <laughs> in developing this it's, in isolation. Um, it, is, it is certainly one of the challenges, and I think we're not alone in our um, and where we're at. And in fact, some councils are arguably in worse positions in that they've just notified their whole district, district plan, plan. Um, which is which is going to mean they're going to have to potentially revoke whole sections and rework wow. them through. So um, there are 
some transitional provisions that are lacking, I think, that would have assisted councils who are partway through processes to, um, to better manage and meet the intent of the bill, but not being able to consult on that okay. or discuss it up front has been a real challenge. Wayne. Jason can probably add to it, but, but essentially the plan change that we were going to bring forward, which is our main focus, which is the urban development for next February, March, to start, is pushed out by a year because this one takes precedence and, and you, you're trying to figure out what bits you might be able to weave into that. Is that about right, Jason? So we are going to need to notify the intensification plan change no later than the 20th of August 2022. It, it's going to be uh, the plan change which responds to the National Policy State for Urban Development intensification policies and, and this bill and this bill does create some constraints on, on what can fit within that process and, and the idea of running a parallel Schedule 1 process on related matters at the same time as we are attempting to run a new intensification streamlined planning process and, and this is set out in the, in the submission is it's not a good idea. It, it creates a lot of complexities for everybody and, and is unlikely to deliver a really good integrated solution. So in terms of the scope of, of the plan change for 2022, yes, we were, uh, we, had some, we had some pretty big ideas um, for a, a, a large mix of things. We still have some pretty big ideas, but we need to now fit them within what we can do through the intensification streamline planning process. So things like greenfield uh, rezoning, the bill limits the kind of greenfield rezoning that you, that you can fit in to that process. It's got to be a pretty simple, straightforward, pretty much just you've got a rural zone over an area, let's now make it a residential zone. If you've got any complexities at all where you're looking to have different kinds of zoning within the new urban area, the bill doesn't give the latitude to include that in the plan change. Um, things like structure planning, which are often a really good idea to deal with those complexities and make sure that things like transport connections are delivered well. Um, anything that has the need for that kind of complexity, the bill doesn't really contemplate us progressing it in 2022. So, so those other things we uh, not saying that work won't happen next year on those things, but what we are saying is that the notification of a plan change to progress those larger greenfield ideas is now looking to be pushed out a bit and hence the message of things might slow down a bit in some respects. But visible progress will still be made next year. Thank you, Jason. I just want to check in with Councillor McCann, um, see if he's got anything he wants to add or ask. It currently looks like a squashed bug on my windscreen. <coughs> is he still there? He is. Is he still here? Um, look, most of the questions that I had um, have long since gone, so I'll probably start with, um, you know, the purpose of the submission is to create change in the bill, and w while I fed into some of the submission and included the wording, you know, that it's a blunt instrument. What I'm really wanting to get from Wayne and whoever is presenting is that our focus is on the substantive changes we want to get. I don't think the government really want to hear why we don't like it, but what the substantive changes are. Can you confirm that that's what your um, emphasis is going to be? Who, who said we didn't like it? <laughs> Um, yes, so our, um, our response is certainly focused around um, changes that we, um, specific changes that we'd like to see made to make what they are proposing and the intent they're looking for workable for us. So that's why there's quite a significant um, section that is all of the technical input that Andrew has kindly worked through for us, which is on a really practical level. These are the things that we really need to have changed to make this be able to be as workable as possible for us. Um, we do still have a role to play in um, reminding government of the other challenges that they're creating for us through this. Um, I think we can all read into the speed um, of this process, how much of that may or may not be able to be taken into account as we work through from here. But 
it's still an important role for us to remind government of the impact that these types of changes can have on us. So we still have an element of that in our submission as well. But we're really, we have really tried to focus in on practical changes that we are looking for to make this work as much as we can. Thank you. I think this, um, the, the writing is, is really good and um, concise. Um, there, I do hang on a have a question. Hang on a sec. I've just got the chief executive who oh. just... Um, we only get 10 minutes. Um, I think Angela was, again, very polite and diplomatic. Um, Councillor, I am certainly going to make sure the government's aware of the potential financial implications and the fact they took one more toy out of our sandpit for collecting revenue. Um, and not in a big way, but it needs to be made clear. Um, I wish that we could say to anybody who comes into our table, if you're going to say something we don't like, don't come. Um, <laughs> I wish that we had that permission. I, I think the government does have to hear some things that it won't like. Back to you, Councillor McCann. Uh, and not entering into debate, I think that's pretty obvious, but the, um, I'm sure now. that that will... Yeah, thank you. Um, subdivision. This is something that I still find quite unclear in terms of the process. Um, what do the staff feel is going is going to end up when we um, the implementation of the bill was to increase the opportunity for um, intensification, but it doesn't really paint a picture of how the subdivisions will occur practically after that, and whether we can oppose them or whether we just won't have any tools in the toolbox to use a phrase that's been bandied about. Um. Yeah, it is a it is a challenge in, um, of interpreting the bill of how the intensification provisions and the um, both the retention of subdivision consent and the lack of minimum lot size kind of all work together. Um, on a, a kind of a high level, I think one of the um, consequences that we might see of this is a lot more um, intensification without subdivision. You might end up seeing a lot more cross lease type scenarios that you used to get in the 70s when people were trying to avoid subdividing the land previously, which can be really messy and legally complicated um, and can be quite a challenge as land passes from owner to owner. They often get more complicated and, um, and difficult to understand. Um, so I think there is a, a lack of clarity around exactly what those implications might be um, we may also see a lot more of um, of properties being sold um, as a whole with more than one house on them in the future if we are seeing a lot more intensification of people building a second dwelling on their property for multi-generational type um, scenarios where people want to have their parents living in a small um, but self-contained house out the um, on their property, you might just end up seeing a lot more properties that are sold in that way, which might actually um, reflect a different way that people are going to be living in, on properties in that way in the future. Um, but I suspect there will be a lot more of that kind of cross-lease um, sort of arrangements when people generally try and avoid having to pay for subdivision consent if they can get away with it. And in this scenario, there will be a lot more opportunities to intensify without the need for subdivision. Um, do you guys have anything else to add on that from a technical level? Yeah, I might just add a couple of other points. Um, from, from a technical perspective, and look, so, sorry to cor correct you, no, it, no. Um, the definition of subdivision under the Resource Management Act is actually quite broad and does include things such as cross leases and um, unit titles for like creating apartments. Mm -hmm. So. In, in, in an instance where a cross lease is being created or altered or where unit titles are being created for apartments, a subdivision consent will still be mm. required. So the council will still have a consent process through which to exercise discretion there. I think the big impact though of the bill in terms of subdivision is not just the loss of, um, the loss of uh, minimum lot size, but there are some um, quite detailed provisions in the bill that mean that um, if a developer undertakes a subdivision and demonstrates that all dwellings on that subdivision can comply with the medium density residential standards, they can apply for a subdivision consent for that subdivision and then just continue to construct the dwellings without any land use resource consent. So what that means is that the council will have very limited ability to um, influence the design of the subdivision, the um, arrangement of lots, the size. They won't be able, you won't be able to influence the size of lots. 
um, and, you, and, and you'll have limited control, if any, over the, um, the design outcomes of the buildings themselves. Um, so that, and, and that's included in the submission. Um, but that, that's probably the other big implication from a subdivision perspective. All right, I'm just checking back with you, Rob. Have, have we done? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for those answers. Thanks, Rob. And look, I team, I think what we're hearing from certainly the answers is it uh, highlights the complexity of what's been proposed. Um, I mean, obviously, even just with our very um, experienced staff, um, just them getting their heads around it and the ins and outs and, and so forth. So um, one last one from me. What, what is sometimes frustrating, it's not a criticism of the team, is when we make submissions on things like this and then not knowing how effective they were. You know, out of the 10 things that we raised, it's a little bit like kind of where's Wally when you're looking at the final outcome trying to find, did they listen? So maybe just some... Uh, any response in terms of how will you guys come back and, and say uh, they've now gone through the process, this is what's been determined and they didn't listen or they did and they've made one change. It is always challenging to know exactly um, what changes get made and where but we can certainly um, try and come back with some kind of update about where the bill lands once it gets um, reported back in. I think that would be awesome. I said the same to the roading team when we made a submission. It's just it's nice to know, you know, if you had an effect in terms of that process and, and whether, you know, something was adopted or not from us and other councils. All right, well, I'm going to um, uh, go for a short break. So, um, Emily and the team, um, thank you very much. Angie, you're welcome to um, leave and we can all remove our masks and... Um, in the process, uh, no, no disrespect intended, <laughs> and uh, and thank you all for um, walking us through that today. Um, Council, we're going to take a short break for ten minutes, and then we'll come back in for the next part of the paper. And it looks like we're probably aim to be finished by about twelve thirty if you all behave. So, um, uh, looking at the rest of the agenda, so if we can be back in at ten to twelve, that'd be great.